Hello guys and gals, and this is a oh, this is part 17 of our reading of Pandora's Jeans. It is a book by Catherine Lance. And we're going to go over the copyright information here, which clearly says that this is a 1985 copy of the book. And um, I'm finding the actual physical book here, popular library edition, copyright 1985 by Catherine Lance and all rights reserved. And I have the author's written permission to read this book on my YouTube channel. And uh, so, yeah, there's that. So, anyways, in the last episode, oh, let me go back to this. Um, they set a trap and they were able to catch the, the, the traitor's leader. Uh, the traitors being the religious zealot sect of um, people or something like that. We're going to find out more about that. Um, I don't know, remember exactly where we left off, but we are really making some progress here. So, in the, the, um, the leader was going to face a death. They were going to kill the leader. Um, tie him to a machine body and he would just eventually die. Okay, chapter 5. Though it was early morning, the principal could already feel the sun hot on his neck as he stood outside the gate waiting to be admitted to the new garden. Nearly two years after she had told him she was sick, the old woman was, was at last dying. He had set out immediately as soon as he received her message. His own emotion so his own emotions so confused. He didn't know quite what he felt. He could not imagine why she had summoned him. She had long since made it clear that he was no more welcome at her deathbed than in her life. Whatever her motivation, it must have been important to her and therefore undoubtedly important to him as, oh, and their shared concerns. He felt certain that it must somehow have it must somehow have to do with his fight against the traitors although the women scientists had long since returned to the garden the men who were conducting the, clin the conducting the clinic in were in constant communication with them he himself avoided the clinic and daniel who was now in charge of the project as much as possible but made it a point to keep informed about the testing and he knew that the number of citizens seeking help had lessened even though the reward for testing had been increased to two pieces of metal there had been no more incidents, but the principal was coming to realize that he had made a terrible mistake in trying to stop the spread of the traitors by executing their leader. The huge rusted machine body where the man had died in agony was apparently becoming a shrine. Daily bunches of fresh flowers appeared despite the effort of, of his guards to keep the area off limits. The guards reported too that every day dozens of citizens approached making the sign of the spiral as they passed the spot. He, he had, the principal now realized, made a martyr of the man as the Jewish Christian Messiah had been martyred over 2,000 years ago, but the Dinas, but the Dinas take it. What else could he have done? If the traitor leader had been executed in private or even been imprisoned, there would have been rumors about his reappearance, possible, possibly attempts to help him escape. Yash himself had seemed to understand this and the principal was beginning to suspect that he uh, he principal per, perhaps oh here sorry i'm gonna have to read this again i was thrown off by this word yash himself has seemed to understand this and the principal was beginning to suspect that he had perhaps deliberately sought martyrdom after the questioning which had produced no information the principal did not already have, Yash and the four men who had been captured with him had been bound to the rusting metal sides of the great machine from before the change that lay rotting at the base of the great tree. Not wheeled like most machine bodies, the execution machine had once moved by means of metal treads. The remaining rusted links gave it an even more fantastical form than most machine bodies. Quite apart from the suffering involved, death on the machine was assumed by most residents of the capital involved the especially horrible form of contamination by wild dinas. Though the principal repeatedly 
though the repeated, oh, though the principal repeatedly and publicly denied the wild Dinas or anything else inhabited the machines, privately he suspected that the superstition helped serve as a deterrent to capital crimes. After three days, not certain why he did so, but drawn, but drawn there, perhaps to show that he had no fear of the traitors, the principal and two of his men had approached the crowd where the traitors lay dying in the hot sun. The principal saw among those who had come from curiosity or to jeer at the prisoner, many faces streaked with sorrow. He heard murmurs as the crowd parted before him, and then he was standing in front of the traitor leader. He was scarcely recognizable now. His face was darkened and cracked, and cracked. his lips dry and blistered, and bruises from his capture and questioning shone blue and yellow beneath the parched skin. His eyes were filmed, yet a spark within them met the principal's gaze. The traitor leader blinked, focusing, and looked at the principal, waiting. What good do, you, do your traitor gods do to you now, the principal said. There is only there is one God only, said Yash, his voice weak but surprisingly clear. The God of nature, the God of truth, the God of lies, you mean, the said Red angrily. The principal waved him quiet. You're finished, said the principal. You're dying. Two of your men are already dead. We will live again in truth, said Yash. The principal w was uncom uncomfortably aware of the many faces and ears around him. He felt sweat beginning to dampen his tunic and knew he should not debate with the man. Should, oh, should turn and walk away, but he could not help himself. He was drawn to the young leader. Though he could not say why, he wanted to understand him, to convert him, as perhaps Yash wanted to convert the principal. I have no doubt that you are sincere in your beliefs, the principal said, but you are wrong, and your ideas are dangerous. I don't want, I don't want to do this. You left me no choice. The traitor leader was silent for a moment, and then he smiled grotesquely, a trickle of blood running from the corners of his mouth where the skin had cracked. Are you asking my forgiveness, he whispered. I ask nothing of you, the principal said. He was on the point of turning away when the man spoke again, his voice weaker. Nevertheless, I do forgive you. You don't know any better. I could even thank you. You have done more to help us by this one act than we have accomplished in a year of work in the district. The principal felt his anger subside to be replaced by a prickle of unease in his belly. He knew that this was true. The man to the right of Yash moaned then and muttered something. Yash turned to him. Have faith, Brother Martin. It will end soon. He shut his eyes, and for a moment the principal thought he had lost consciousness, but the young leader's eyes opened again to slits and began to and he began oh, ah, to slits and he began to speak. So softly and hoarsely that the principal could barely hear him. The seeds of evil have been planted in you, he said, but I know that you are not yourself evil. I learned that from Brother Zack. The principal started so violently that Red put his hand on his arm. Are you all right, sir? What did you say? The principal demanded, not certain that he had heard the man correctly. He could not have heard him correctly. What did you say? He pulled away from Red's grasp the traitor leader's and grasped the traitor leader's shoulders. The man groaned and opened his mouth, but his words were lost in a croak. Water, the principal shouted. Red handed him the water, the water bag, and the principal held it to the young man's mouth. Yash turned his head away. Drink, you must tell me. No, he, he murmured. He sighed and whispered. Besides, if they see you give me water, they'll think you do it only to prolong my torment. Recognizing that this too was true, the principal turned and flung the water skin to the ground where it burst and clear fluid to the clear fluid disappearing into the sparse grass. The traitor leader seemed to be losing consciousness in anger and fear. The principal strode across the grassy field back towards his house. Red and his guards scurried, scurrying to, to catch up. He heard behind him the shout, Monster, offer him water and then pour it out. May the Dinas take you. He was so shaken he didn't even turn. Standing at the gate to the garden, he heard again the traitor leader's words. He could not have said, Zack. Thinking it over a hundred times since, the principal realized that his mind must have 
played a trick on him. No one else had heard anything. The mistress wishes to see you now. The principal looked up to see Gunda, the fat, red-haired woman, standing before him. He sh took a deep breath, dreading the, t dreading the coming ordeal. He had had to fill, he had 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 his fill of death and the dying and the dying. The room was so dark, darkened that it was difficult to see more than an arm's length ahead. The old woman lay heavily covered despite the late summer heat, her frail body nearly swallowed up by thick coverings. The stench of sickness hung in the air like morning fog, and the principal resisted the impulse to throw up, throw open the windows. The two women at the bedside stepped away and left the room, and he approached, feeling nauseated. I'm here, mother, he said. She opened her eyes and looked up at him, not quite focusing. He sat by her side, by the side of the bed, rather. She was impossibly thin. He didn't know how she had managed to stay alive for so long. Possibly the wild Dina was in her. Her hand rested on the coverlet beside her, so frail that it seemed to have no weight. For just a moment, he had an impulse to cover her hand with his own. Will, she said, her voice only a whisper. I ask you to, to come here because you must think of the future. The future I is the future is assured now, he said, because of you and your work. Nothing is assured, she said. He realized that she must be referring to his struggle with the traitors, and for a moment he thought of telling her all that had happened with the traitor leader, but she was speaking again. There's much, there's much to accomplish here, she went on, more perhaps than you will be able to do. I mean to say you will provide for succession. He stared at her, startled. How could she have known that he had, that he had been on his, that, how could he know that that had been on her mind ever since the first attack by the traitor spies? I know, I know it, he said. She seemed to not hear him. No matter what your personal feelings, she went on, you must take a wife, one who is not susceptible to the sickness. Again, he nodded, astonished. At one time, the old woman would have done anything in her power to keep him away from all women. Did she understand that he had changed? More likely, the future of her project was more important to her even than her feelings about him. I will do it, old woman, he said. A wife, she said with some intensity, a companion, a helpmeet, someone who understands what must be done, not as you have done in the past. He took a deep breath and stood. Is it your plan, then, to control my actions from the grave? She was silent a moment, then spoke, her weak voice full of disgust. It has always been my hope, she said, that you would learn to control your own actions. Again, he drew in air and held it. His anger was not lessened, by the knowledge that she was right. Will, she said, when you did not ask again, uh, Will, she said, when he did not ask again, sit down. Don't you think it's hard for me to say this? For a long time, I believed that our work at the garden was all that mattered. And in a sense, it is. But I know now that it is meaningless without structured society. A structured society, rather. Without your society, I don't want to see anything happen to it. The future of my work depends on the future of yours, and that depends on a stable succession. He looked down at her, astonished. He knew what it, what it had cost her to say those words. A flame of anger still licked at the corners of his mind, but it was mixed with the beginnings of respect. He let out a deep breath, then sat beside her again. I understand you, he said. I have been thinking the same thing for a long time now. Her lips smacked together two or three times. Then she gave a profound, exhausted sigh. I wish, she said. He leaned close to her. But then she began to cough deeply and heavily. Her eyes rolled up until the whites showed. Alarmed, he opened the door to call for the women who had been attending her. Several women rushed in and crowded around the bedside, their voices low and heavy with sobs. The principal scarcely realized that Evie was among them until his eyes met hers across the bed of the dying woman. She acknowledged him with a widen, with a widening of her plum-colored eyes, then bent over the old woman, gripping her hand and stroking her hair. The principal stood by the shadow, not wanting to be there. 
yet unable to leave. The mistress looked once at, at him and seemed about to speak. Then she closed her eyes, and her breathing became more labored. After nearly an hour of struggling, during which she no longer seemed aware of anything, she again opened her eyes. She stared at the floor of the the foot of the bed, as if seeing something there. She lifted her head off the pillow, then murmured a word. Silently, she became rigid and fell back. Her eyes opened, at last gone. The sobbing of the women in the room became louder now. The principal lifted a corner of curtain. Outside, the sky was bright with summer sun. He felt a tug at his sleeve and turned to see, to see Evie, her face streaked with tears, her eyes red and swollen. I'm sorry, he said to her. I know you are, she said. I know she I knew I know she was your mother. The principal looked at her in surprise. The old woman had never wanted that known, even among the women of the garden. The other women were now doing the necessary things, all except Katha, who still sat at the side of the bed, her face dry but rigid in mourning. Did you hear her last words? asked Gunda, rubbing the back of her friend's neck. I heard, said Katha. She said just one word. She looked up and caught the principal's eye. She fixed him with a look of hatred so intense that he felt it in the soles of his feet. Then she said, the word was Zach. Okay. The women and children of the garden stood quiet. This is chapter six, by the way. The women and children of the garden stood quietly at the grave while Gunda spoke of the mistress's life and work. Evie stood dreamily tears silently sliding down her cheeks while Katha was pale as a December sky, her feelings hidden. The principal himself felt numb. There was a feeling like sorrow in the pit of his stomach, but the only sense of loss he felt was for Zach, as if his mother's death had renewed his mourning of his brother. He felt regret, too, that he and the old woman had not communicated more, particularly in these last years, but even at the end they were they had not been able to speak two words to each other without anger and misunderstanding arising. There was a great deal between them that would now remain forever buried. He thought again of her last words to him. In many ways, the conversation had been typical of her, despite her recognition of all that he had accomplished. There was no, there was no least hint of affection or forgiveness. After the ceremony, there was a simple breakfast. The principal took part impatiently. He was staying only because Evie had asked to talk to him. At last, they were in the labor laboratory together. Despite her mourning, she looked lovely, her dark hair gathering at her neck and spilling down the back of her white lab coat. I have good news for you, she said without preamble. We may have solved the major puzzle of the sickness. The reason the trait doesn't extinguish itself before she, before she died, the mistress examined our evidence and reasoning and asked me to submit it to you. He wondered if it were a form of posthumous. He, he wondered if it was a form of posthumous flattery. The old woman had never asked his opinion on scientific matters while she lived. He frowned, trying to remember the crux of the problem. The difficulty, he said, was that men who pass on the trait would, in theory, produce fewer offspring than those who do not. Is that right? Evie nodded. We have great, a great deal of statistical information from the testing in the district and more from your soldiers in the field camp. We think the answer must be that the sperm that carries that carry the trait are more mobile or in some other way more viable than normal sperm. The principal thought a moment, of course, and with polyandry, the prevailing form of marriage, yes, since each woman has at least two or three husbands, a carrier is more likely to father any children. What, what's exciting is that we should now be able to discover which men are carriers once we've devised a test, if only we had more and better equipment. It's only a matter of time till you work work it out," said the principal. <clears throat> okay, so I think so too," she gestured happily and enthusiastic. Within a few years, there will be no reason why any woman should ever die of the sickness. Once we have our test, that can be added to the work already being done at the clinic, and of course, we'll have to open more clinics and a training school for technicians. The principal had never seen her so animated. He caught her enthusiasm, envisioned a, 
a clean, well-fed, and literate popu population streaming in and out of the great centers of learning that would spring up around the, his clinics. Of course, the problem of the traders would still have to be solved, but all at once he felt that nothing was beyond him. Evie was speaking again, and he had to ask her to repeat what she had said. I have a present for you. He laughed, startled and pleased. What sort of present? She rose, smiling oddly, as if she were trying to keep from laughing, and led him to the back of the long room, where he could hear the squawking, the, the squeaking and squeaking, and scuffling sounds of caged animals. She stopped at a crate on the floor and knelt. Come look, she said. He knelt beside her and peered over the, the edge. Inside baby, Evie's fox cat, lay stretched on her side while three tiny replicas of her drank hungrily from her teats. Baby, ba uh, Babies, babies, Evie said proudly. I want you to take one of them before he, c he can protest. Oh, before he could protest, he had no time for he had no time for a pet. S she said quickly, "Listen to me. The day the traders first attacked the clinic, Baby was agitated and wild. I finally had to take her home. I'm sure she knew what was going to happen. There have been other times when she acted to protect me. I think that if you keep a fox cat near you, you'll be safer from trader spies." He looked at her quickly, quickly, then down at the animals. Two were identical in color and coloring to babies, golden orange, while the third was lighter with dark brown stripes streaking its flank and limbs, the radi and radiating from its eyes like a mask. The kitten's fringed, pointed ears were so large that they resembled wings. Which one shall I take? He asked laughingly. Whichever one pleases you, she said. They're all males, and they're all healthy. The striped fox cat rolled onto its back, then suddenly twisted and pounced on Baby's tail, which had been slow, slowly twitching. Baby gently cuffed the child and shook the others off and stood and stretched. She put her paw up on the edge of the box and yawned loudly before sniffing the principal's outstretched hand. Um... It's as if she knows what what we're what we're here for," he said. "I think she does," said Evie seriously, her voice full of pleasure. "Meow," the ba said Baby, jumping out of the box as if to give the principal a better view. The striped kitten and one of its brothers had begun to wrestle with each other, rolling over and over, battling at one, batting at one another with their tiny paws. The striped kitten fastened its teeth on the other's ear, and with a cry, the golden baby pulled away. His brother followed for a moment, then abruptly turned and looked up at the principal, its clear green eyes open to the challenge. Our? It squeaked. Our? The principal chuckled and tentatively reached his hand in, into the box. Won't baby, won't baby be upset if I take one of her children? I don't think so. She's been weaning them. I've watched her training them to hunt for small creatures. They're, they're nearly as big as she was when I found her. The striped kitten sniffed the principal's hand, then suddenly turned and snapped at its own tail. The principal withdrew his hand, startled. At that moment, Baby leapt back into the box and held the striped kitten down with one paw, then began vigorously to wash it, her rough, her rough tongue moving over, over the kitten's face, back and tail her son squirming and squealing in protest, but she didn't stop until its fur was damp and gleaming. She then looked up quizzically, looked quizzically up at the principal and, and took the baby in her mouth by the back of the neck, then gently leaping, she again left the box and set the baby at the principal's feet. The little fox cat shook itself, then stretched its legs up to the principal's knee then stretched its legs up to the principal's knees. I think, said Evie, that baby and her son have chosen you. The principal put a tentative hand down towards the furry little creature at his knees. It took the, it took the tip of his thumb in its mouth and bit gently, then let go and began to buzz contentedly, rubbing against his legs. I name him ne Napoleon. The principal said, smiling. Thank you, baby, and thank you, Evie. I'm touched. I can't help worrying about your safety, Evie said, 
rising, and besides, you're o you've always seemed so lonely. The principal felt his heart turn over. Suddenly he understood the old woman's last words to him. He took the baby fox cat in his arms and followed Evie to the nearest bench. Come to the capital with me, he said. She nodded. I want to help find I, I want I want to help found a permanent school for technicians. I mean now, he said, today. Come with me. Evie looked at him. Her face was soft and there was something more behind her eyes. Was it fear? She took a long time to answer. I can't, she said. Why not? My work is here. Bring it with you. I need a month or, or two more. I need a month or two more. Evie, I want to marry you. He's, he was almost startled at his words as she appeared to be. Oh, he was almost as startled at his words as she appeared to be. But he realized he had been thinking of this for some time. Her dark eyes filled with tears, and she looked away, then shook her head. The principal glowered down at the, the hearth. On it lay two large pieces of marble and some chips ruined forever, a chunk of splintered wood dangling from the carved ledge of the mantel. Lindy, the young serving boy, was cowering in a corner while the baby fox cat stood on the window ledge, growling in distress. The principal was ashamed of himself. His temper had again resulted in unnecessary destruction, but he couldn't stop it. Send someone to clean this up, he shouted at the boy, and bring me another pitcher of brew. He walked to the He walked to the other end of the room, then back again. He had been unable to relax for a minute since leaving the garden. He had left his men far behind, driving his mount so hard that she began to stumble, unable to catch her breath, but the faster he rode, the more clearly he could see the image of Evie as she gazed at him with her troubled eyes and said, Thank you, but no. At first he thought she had misunderstood him. Their lives had been entwined for so many years now. It seemed uh, obvious that they were meant to be together. Never had he felt so comfortable with another person, never since Zach. He wanted to explain all this to her, to show her the reasoning, all that, all all he said was, why not? She frowned and turned her head away. I can't marry you, please. Don't ask me to say more. He thought for a moment and nodded. You're a daughter of the garden, he said. Your work is more is the most important thing to you. I understand that, but Evie, daughters can marry. My own brother was married to a daughter of the garden. She turned back to him, looking frightened. It isn't that, she whispered. Please, forget me and let me be. You've heard stories about me, he said about the way I treated women. I don't believe them. It's not that. Wait. Oh, and we are about out of time. We have been reading from Pandora's Jeans. It is a book by Catherine Lance. And if you like this content, then make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way or join the Discord server, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day. I can find the button here.